Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Boyce of Reason. I am your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Calm Versant is Josh Slocum, who is the head header of the Disaffected podcast and YouTube channel. In this conversation, we talk about the psychopathy in current day politics, especially as it's exhibited upon the left. I learned a lot more about this thing called the Cluster B Personality Disorder Profile than I have before, so it was very educational for me. So if you did as well, do check out his podcast. It will be linked in the description. Again, that's the Disaffected podcast, and here is Josh Slocum. You have this uh, YouTube channel that you've been running for about eight months now? Nine? I think coming up in eight months, yeah, I think we started uh, last week of January is when we started the show. How's it going for you? Good. Good. I I mean, I like it. It's, it's brand new to me. I haven't done this before, so... Um, you know, I don't have any basis of comparison, but it's um, <laughs> people seem to people seem to respond to it. Um, you know, it's the show disaffected is um, we talk about a lot of the topics, a lot of the same topic matter that shows up on your show and on lots of other people's shows that I think I think we're all sort of in a a similar conceptual universe responding to wokeness and the, the breakdown of politics and culture and society. So um, I'm I'm glad to be I'm glad to be a part of that, and and I hope that um, you know I hope it, it seems to it seems to resonate with people the sorts of connections that that Kevin and I try to make on this show about what's mm -hmm. going on politically and culturally and what it has to do with individual psychology which i think is a is a neglected area of investigation i think that regardless of whether you're on the side of wokeness or you're against wokeness or you're somewhere in the middle and trying to figure it out i think a lot of conversation about these topics speaks about it on a high level a systemic level and I, I realize that even using the word systemic is is difficult anymore because everybody hears dot 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 racism dot 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 phobia mm -hmm. um, but I think that individual psychology and individual character and individual emotional disposition is a really key factor in understanding why we are where we are well what's the What's your diagnosis of where this psychological hiccup is coming from? Well, as anybody who sees me on Twitter or ever watches the show knows, I never shut up about this. Um, my diagnosis is cluster B personality disorders et sequelae. <laughs> um, uh, I think that I think that we are living in an age in which Pathological levels of narcissism, self-absorption, emotional instability that are characteristic of people who have cluster B personality disorders, but also can be characteristic of people who are in the sway, in the circle of influence um, that such manipulative people have. I think that we are, I think we're living in a cluster B world right now. I think that narcissism <laughs> is ascendant. Well, okay, so what is this cluster B? And is there like other clusters, like a cluster delta? Yeah, but cluster B is the best one. <laughs> Don't pay attention to clusters A and C. B is where it's at, baby. Um, <laughs> cl cluster B is a term... Uh, from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's the American term. I think uh, maybe an older term or one that might still be used in other parts of the world. Um, they, they call them Axis II disorders, I think. Hmm. Cluster B, well, first, what are personality disorders? And this to me is very important. Um, personality disorders are a kind of mental illness, but they are not the kind of mental illness that that phrase usually evokes in people's heads, right? So when we, when we talk among friends, when we talk publicly, when we use the term mental illness, we're generally thinking of things like high levels of anxiety, uh, major depression, 
possibly schizophrenia, possibly bipolar disorder, which is just the new euphemism for manic depression. We tend to think of mental illness carries a connotation often unspoken but always present of sympathy we believe that our job is to that our def that we are obliged to take a default sympathetic stand toward those that we think are suffering from mental illness i mean that phrase that i just in used in order to avoid stigmatization correct right? but, um yeah. Cluster B personality disorder personality disorders are not that kind of mental illness. They are what they say in the name. They are disorders of personality. They do imply exactly that very uncomfortable thing that many of us wish they did not imply. They imply a problem with a person's very character, their morals, their disposition toward other people, their propensity to relate to other people cooperatively or exploitatively. Um, this is, you know, before we medicalize this, these are things that were known as character disorders. And in fact, the original term um, in the 19th century that was often applied to what we call personality disorders today was moral insanity. Uh, yeah. and, and people really, really, really dislike that. But I think it needs to, mm -hmm. I think it needs to be examined again. So the cluster B disorders, there are ostensibly four of them. Borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. And antisocial is what mm -hmm. regular people know as psychopathy. So this is the family of disorders that includes psychopathy, people without a conscience. And the thing that, yeah. why they are all clustered together, these four, is because they share many common features. And in my view, the fundamental common denominator among all of them is excessive narcissism. It's not the case that just because only one of them is called narcissistic personality disorder, that that's the only one that shows narcissism. That's not true, it's a misunderstanding. All the cluster Bs have a high, high dose of narcissism, but there are differences. Could we, for the sake of diagnosis, define narcissism? Sure. So narcissism, in this sense, meaning in a pathological, excessive sense. All of us have narcissism. Uh, it's not actually a dirty word at its root definition. There are healthy levels of narcissism, and if we didn't have any, we wouldn't even have a self-preservation instinct. So normal range humans who are not disordered have a level of narcissism. Some of us have more, some of us have less. In this case, we're talking about a clinical level of narcissism that goes beyond merely being more vain than the average person or more self-regarding. We're talking about a self-absorption so deep that, it, I, that people with this condition are fundamentally exploitative of other people. They are frequently pathological liars. Um, they exploit other people. They pretend to have friendships that they don't really truly value as friendships. They see people as objects to be moved around on a chessboard. That's pathological narcissism. Mm -hmm. And just to harken back to what you're talking about, about character flaw or some sort of warped character, is this cluster B or access to um, family, is this downstream of culture? Is this downstream from ideology? Is this something that is baked into the individual by the brain, by the organism itself, or is it some sort of nurturing glitch? That's an open question. What I suspect, and, and a lot of people suspect this, I, I don't know if it's true, I don't think anyone knows the answer, but it seems to be, like with any human uh, set of characteristics, there's a, a biological influence and a, and a nurturing influence, right? So it's very likely that there mm -hmm. are some genetic predispositions in temperament and, emo and affect stability or instability that mm -hmm. make per a person more or less vulnerable to developing a disorder like this, but there is a huge contribution, um, I'm convinced, from nurture, from the environment. So what you find in the backgrounds of people who are either diagnosed or, or can be observed uh, to be people with cluster B disorders, there, there's usually trauma and child abuse in their backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. 
it, it it's it's one way of thinking about the cycle of intergenerational trauma and abuse in a family. Um, if you mm -hmm. if you've got a parent who's narcissistic or a wildly unstable uh, person with borderline personality disorder, chances are very high that that person's mother or father or both of them also uh, had this condition. There are apparently some cases, particularly with regard to psychopathy. Well, and, and, and I, you know, I shouldn't say particularly. There are apparently some cases of cluster B personality disorders that don't appear to have a trauma background. There's no evidence of necessarily of child abuse or other kinds of abuse. Um, and I mean, personally, I believe, couldn't prove it and wouldn't claim that I can prove it, but I've seen enough that I'm fairly well convinced that there are sadly rare cases of children who are born essentially psychopathic. They appear to have no conscience there to develop at all from a very early age. That seems to be real, but it's not the usual way that you see this. So when analyzing a cultural movement such as what we call the woke or wokeness, are you attempting or do you see the possibility of making meaning of it as conditions of some sort of simulated trauma or uh, instability in the environment that then leads to the manifestation of these characteristics en masse, in mass? Like the, this cluster B personality is somehow being evoked by the conditions of our media, social media environment. Is that uh, something that you think is... Uh, we can we can relate to that, and then if we can relate to that or make that connection, what do we do from there? Right. Well, y yes, partially yes to all of that, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. The way yeah. I see it, yes, I do think that social media particularly seems to have the ability, uh, by its very nature, by its structure, by the fact that, that human um, tone of voice facial expressions, all of these things are removed from the interaction, right? So we only have these words, and it happens at a very rapid time clip, right? People don't, people don't have time to reflect. They don't have time to sit back in their seat and consider, or they perceive that they don't have that time. So, and, and this happens to me too. Mm. This, I think it happens to all social media users to one degree or another. Seems to be something about the structure of that that both attracts people with these personality disorder characteristics, but also encourages them in people who are not otherwise personality disordered or somebody that we would say in a global sense mm -hmm. in their whole lives, we wouldn't say that this person is a clinical narcissist, right? So it, mm -hmm. social media seems to drive us all to act like narcissists to some degree, but I think it particularly attracts, favors, and features those who really are diagnosable. And I think that... Okay. The, this, in some senses, this is an analogy, but in some ways, I, I mean it very directly. I believe what's happening now culturally that we call wokeness, but that isn't just confined to the woke anymore. The mainstream has accepted it, right? And I, I consider sitting on the sidelines and not pushing back, I consider that acceptance. So when people say, oh, I'm not into that, I'm not into that, I'm on the left and I'm not into that. Yes, I know, but you do not object to it. You very conspicuously keep your counsel. You are, in fact, part of it. Um, you're allowing this to set the tone of our discourse. So I see this as a scaled up version of domestic abuse because... And especially if people are hearing cluster B for the first time or personality disorders for the first time, they may think that they've never met people like this, or they may think, well, that means psychopaths, and psychopaths are serial killers, and I've never met a serial killer, so as long as I stay away from there, I'm not ever going to run into these people. That's a mistake. Or CEOs. Or, or CEOs, right. Yeah. Um, that's a mistake. I, I don't believe that any one of us has not had a cluster B in their lives. Um, it's just that we don't know it by this name. This is the psychological profile of abusive husbands who batter their wives or who molest their children. It is the psychological profile of many different kinds of abusive mothers, emotionally abusive or neglectful, narcissistic mothers, stage mothers, um, smothering and devouring mothers who, uh, who project and appear to the world like the most empathetically attuned mommy ever, 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 who loves her widow kitty so very, very much, right? 
This is often pathological and, and extraordinarily damaging to the children in ways that we don't see behind closed doors. This dynamic, this is the dynamic that I grew up in. This is my family. When you are in such a family, you play a role. Cluster B rules are also known as cult rules. To me, talking about cults and talking about cluster B is talking about the same okay. thing. They're different names, but they are the same psychology. I, I'm, I am sensing a, a very particular uh, relationship to power, or what we call power. Yes, sir. Power over people, power to affect people, uh, and control. Uh, yes. So you can scale that up to a cult, and you can probably scale that up to certain uh, countries that we've seen throughout history. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, it, it ought to be obvious, but I, I say these things at the risk of sounding pedantic, because what ought to be obvious often is not. This is the psychology mm. of the Third Reich. This is the psychology of the killing fields. This is the psychology of communism. This is the psychology of... Uh, you know, these totalitarian societies, that's cluster B. That's cult. Pick whatever word you like. We are talking about the same character pathology. But hmm. this is one area where that famous phrase that many of us know really comes into its own. Fascism begins in the home. That's not hmm. a clever way of saying it. It's a fundamental truth. This is where it begins. This is where we learn these relationships. Mm -hmm. And the narcissistic parent, the cluster B parent, is a tyrant, is a cult leader of one family. And the children play different roles. There might be one child who's usually the scapegoat of all of that parent's emotional instability. There might be another child okay. that we think of as the golden child, right, who can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. And that golden child may be come and meshed with the parent and start abusing his sister or brother, who's the scapegoat. We see these dynamics happening in public right now. We see it all the time. Hmm. Cancellation is part of that. So I think that, yes, it does scale. One thing that I've noticed, maybe this is somehow, uh, you can help me understand this. So one discourse, one critique of what we call wokeness, um, which it's still, as a term, you just have to use yeah. it. So whatever that means, I think we kind of all kind of know what that means, but let's just use that loosely. Sure. One thing about it is that you can, one critique is that you can say it's a religion, you can say it's a cult, but the thing is that is missing from classic cults, cult classic, <laughs> is that there's a central leader. There's something about, there's something about the wokeness that is decentralized. It's, yes. it's uh, in the cloud and these things can emerge over and over again. You see that at, when it, this was happening across or just isolated more or less within colleges, you just see the same pattern popping up. Like Evergreen was just the l most, uh, the c most p colorful peacock in that, you know, bunch. I don't know what a collective of peacocks is called. Maybe somebody can help me in the comments, but, um, you know, it's it just like there are certain personality things that happen. There's certain triggers of it. There's like this created trauma that then leads to the drama that then leads to this power relationship that's just acted out in this way without really understanding like, you know, l the longevity of changing this institution. It's just in the moment. So what is it about the conditions of um, of wokeness, of something like evergreen, something like what we see in the cultural soup at large that makes it emergent, cult-like, and yet without a central power? Well, I'm not sure, and I, I don't even think that people who study this academically and professionally are yet sure, um, but the guess I would make is the lack of, a, the lack of one charismatic leader does not a non-cult make if you will. Um, I think, and it may hmm. be primarily social media, um, I don't think we need one charismatic leader. Clearly, for this dynamic to happen, it is not a necessary condition that there be one charismatic leader around which okay. all the adherents coalesce. That is not true. Clearly. Open your eyes and look around in the world. Everyone can see that that is true. Uh, it seems to be more, the leadership is distributed and revolving, right? People come in and out of fashion mm -hmm. as this week's spokesperson for critical race theory in the media or next week's uh, best example of, um, you know, whatever it is. I mean, you know, some of the leaders themselves we see get canceled, 
right? So they get shoved out. But the ideology stays mm -hmm. there, and the, and the adherents find a new person to coalesce around or a set of them. So I, I don't think, okay. you know... I think it's 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 splitting semantic hairs without a purpose for people to say no. This is not a cult. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me uh, let me uh, go down another line of inquiry. Why did this infect the civil rights movement? What was it about the struggle for justice and progress that made it, in your mind, if you have any ideas about this, particularly success susceptible to uh, this? Uh, these unhealthy dynamics, these uh, disorders of personality and these disorders of uh, control and narcissism and antisociality. Do you have any uh, do you have any guesses of why the left was what this took root in so voraciously? Yes. Um, my guess is that this that movements for justice, for civil rights, for equality, and, and for people who, you know, I mean, I don't think I've said this uh, during the time we've been talking, I was a woke person. I was a social justice warrior. I was a leftist Democrat. This is where I spent most of my life. Okay. It's only been the past five or six years that I have changed my mind. Okay, so, so you were a Bernie bro. Uh, not not, part not particularly Bernie Sanders, but I was um, okay. uh, intersectional, um, queer rights now, uh, the best male feminist ally ever, right? I did all those things, and I hmm. believed in this stuff. My guess is, hmm. to the degree that other people have a similar experience to me, mm -hmm. Justice-oriented movements are attractive to people who have been trained to see themselves primarily as victims and people who see, who do not have an internal locus of control, they have an external locus of control. Meaning, okay. things that happen to me, happen to me. I did not do anything to set the conditions to make this thing happen. There was yeah. nothing I could do to prevent it. I am a rock in a stream, and the stream comes at me. I can't affect the flow of the stream, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is very, very common, and it's very common for trauma victims. It's very common for child abuse victims, domestic abuse victims to develop this self-paralyzing relationship to the world, right? So I, in fact, you know, in actual fact, was a victim of long-term severe child abuse and exploitation, along with my brother and sister. That is a fact. Physical violence, emotional extortion, psychological torment, institutionalization, right? Real tabloid upbringing. One of the consequences of that is that I absorbed the idea and formed the idea that I was an eternal victim. And I could not see my place in choosing to start relationships with people who were dangerous. I continued to replicate the patterns that I learned in my home by making very bad choices about the people that I associated with and the people that I looked up to. And I see this among men, I see it among almost all people who are victims of genuine trauma. So I think that the sense of victimhood, it is very attractive when you see a group of people who say, we understand. We love you. We love you the way your mother should have loved you. We love you the way you're, and we protect you the way your father should have protected you. We're going to make sure that the world treats you right from now on. It's very seductive. Mm -hmm. And so you understand your place in that, just as you said within an abusive home, there are roles that play. So people, uh, the individuals, let's just say the child doesn't get a chance to really develop their own individuality uh, or they don't have, they're not relaxed enough to start playing around and developing themselves naturally. They understand that there's a guideline to, and rails to walk. And then when they get out of the home or are somehow free from the home, they need, they, it's very easy for them to gravitate to something that does provide uh, more or less rigid uh, rails for them to walk and a 
justice oriented movement gives you a story that replicates the story in your childhood of there's this system that you have no control over, but we can yes. smash it if we work together. And yes. so here's your place. And then there's this lines of privilege. Intersectionality can map onto that. So you have uh, more particle. You're still a body, a white body, a black body, but <laughs> you're at least a little bit more distinct, right? You have a little bit of flavor in there with intersectionality, right? Right. Yes, yes. I think that. And the other part of it uh, that goes along with that is growing up in an environment like that teaches you a distorted definition of what love is, right? So... Hmm. Um, and I realize I'm going to, I use a lot of terms that a lot of people who are listening to this, their initial reaction will be to roll their eyes and sigh. And I understand that when I use words like trauma and abuse cycle and things like that, I do get it. I get the initial reaction. They have been overused and they have been almost emptied of meaning by people who have distorted them for narcissistic reasons. I get it. But I ask everyone to understand that these things are still real. Even though they've been abused, we still get to use these terms because they describe real world things. So when you grow up in a house like that and you have a parent like my mother, my mother, the best description I can give to people, I'll give you two. Although I no longer think that, I think the cluster B disorders, the four of them, overlap so much that it may not be that productive to actually think of them as four discrete disorders. But for the sake of simplicity, my mother has both borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. If you want to know the kind of woman my mother is, she's a cross between Joan Crawford, the famous Hollywood actress, the abusive mother, and the character Margaret White, the mother of Carrie in the horror movie Carrie. If you put those two together, that is the kind of person my mother is. Very typical mm -hmm. of the borderline narcissist mother. Could you just for, I can never remember what borderline means, and I just sing that Madonna song in my head every time I hear it. So <laughs> oh, there's layers and layers of rich irony goodness in that, Benjamin. Are you, are you saying that the, the borderline's actually an onion? There's so many borders. <laughs> there's never ending skins um yeah so borderline yeah borderline personality disorder is one of the cluster b's and it means there there is variation but generally the main features of borderline are affective instability emotional instability okay wild mood swings from elation to despair to abusive outbursts within a period of hours, okay? It's not bipolar. Your friend is not a manic depressive if he goes through these cycles within a day. That is not what he has. He has borderline personality disorder. Characterized by a pathological fear of abandonment that distorts that person's ability to actually understand who their friends are. They self-create abandonment by driving people away. They tend to be exploitative because they're very emotionally needy. Um, they need parenting. They're, they're in a very literal sense. I don't mean this pejoratively. I mean it absolutely descriptively. They have the emotional development stage of a toddler, maybe to an early teenager. They are quite literally toddlers to teenagers emotionally. That's why they look that way when they have tantrums, because they are, in fact, having that kind of tantrum. It borderline means... The original meaning is these people border, they vacillate between neurosis and psychosis. Neurosis is rumination, depression, heightened anxiety, constant self, second self, get, you know, most of us have a level of neurosis. Some of us are low in neurosis, some of us are high in neurosis. I am very high in neurosis. Psychosis, however, is when you cross the line to being disconnected from reality. That can mean things like auditory or visual hallucinations, but it does not necessarily mean that. So one typical way that a borderline crosses over from neurosis into psychosis is delusion, persecutory delusions, where they believe that people who love them, who are their friends, are actively plotting against them. They're spreading rumors about them behind their back. They're going to abandon them in the middle of the woods and, you know, leave them to the tender mercies of nature. That's one typical way a borderline goes over that, that line. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. And so... I interrupted you when you were speaking about your home environment and you were speaking about the love or the wrong kind of love. Are you 
people yes. in your situation t don't typically understand what love is. That's correct. So what happens is when you have a mother or a father like this, the you learn a distorted version of love and what you're actually doing is called trauma bonding, right? So one way that, that people trauma bond your parent loses her temper, your mother loses her temper, she takes a belt mm -hmm. to you, she berates you, she tells you you're stupid, whatever it is she does, right? Or your father, whoever it is. You're scared, you're humiliated, you're destabilized because you, think back to when, when we're little children, our mothers particularly, but also our fathers, when we're really little, they occupy a godlike status in relation to us. They are the first people that we make contact with. They are the first person that we look into their eyes and, and that we love and that we touch and that we ask for sustenance for. This is a primary relationship. So when that goes wrong, everything else goes wrong from that point forward. And okay. after the beating, you, you make up, right? Like sometimes your parent will comfort you while you're crying or do any of these things right after they're done walloping you, right? That's trauma bonding. So what you are learning there often gets repeated in later life in your adult relationships. And one of the ways that that cycle that I just talked about gets repeated in adult relationships is actual full-on sadomasochistic orientation yeah, say, toward each yeah. other. This is sadomasochistic. And yes, it does get eroticized. It absolutely does. Um, mm -hmm. So, the children from households like this, and I am one of those children, uh, do not learn. We tend to become attracted to people who are dangerous. We find them charismatic. We find them sexually seductive. We find them intellectually seductive. And we replicate that relationship with our mother or our father, um, thinking that this person understands us. And when you get a person like that in wokeness, in a social justice place, in a, in a church congregation, in a position of leadership, you fall in love with them, whether it's platonic love or romantic love or something like that. You are seeing your mother or father in this person, and you're not seeing that this... Normal people would say, danger, 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 and you say, home. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And how was that replicated within your political um, life then? How did uh, what uh, the social justice Democrats or whatever it was on the left, that community, replicate that? And how did you go through a process of becoming aware of the pattern that you were replicating? Well, I think for me, it, it's very typical of, of people um, who are under the sway of, of leftist Democrats. I believed that the Democratic Party and the modern left movement really did care about the disadvantaged. You know, I grew up in a poor household, welfare benefits, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. That they really cared about single mothers, they cared about children who didn't have enough to eat. Um, I didn't see the exploitative nature of it. I didn't understand that somebody who wants to make a very good political living by appearing to be a conscientious savior can simply pretend to be that person, but actually be working toward a different goal, right? So it, I had a very naive outlook on this. Then I became involved with what we now look back and call the new atheist movement, right? When Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, came out in 2006, I started going to, co to the conferences. That was my social circle. Those, these were the people that I staged political activities with. And that community, it's not the only one like that, but it, it is, a, it is a, a paradigmatic example. It is chock full of pathological narcissists, clinically diagnosable cases of narcissistic personality disorder. Bloggers... Why? Wait, they think that they're God? So the, it's like, Pardon? oh, atheism, I'm the God now. Is that why? Well, yeah, why? I mean, you know, I, I rejected that when, when, when outside critics said these people are just making themselves God in their own image. I reacted very violently against that. No, they're not. You're stupid, right? You just, mm -hmm. you just can't think without God and you don't understand how really, really smart we are and how like we came up with our own morals just like all on our own. So you're just jealous. I mean, it was really <laughs> immature. Nah, 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 -uh, it's you, right? Hmm. And I used to do this hmm. with my mother. I have friends who've known me for almost 30 years who knew that my mother was floridly abusive, that she was absolutely sometimes psychotically deranged. I defended her 
against my friends who were trying to shake me and say, Josh, your mother is hurting you and she's doing it on purpose and she does not care that it makes you cry. And I got angry at my friends and I said my friends were terrible people. My mother mm -hmm. just had a huge bunch of anxiety, but she meant well. And how could you say that about my mother? Because I couldn't face the truth, right? We do the same things. I did the same things when I was part of that. What woke me up was, yeah. um, well, it, it, it was seeing my mother for who she was for the first time in my life. So at 12 years old, between 12 and 13, I was taken out of my home. Um, there were the the abuse was was um, so over the top that I was trying to kill myself at 12 years old. So we went to family court and my, and I was basically institutionalized in a glorified orphanage, a children's home, during my teen years, which was very difficult, but in fact may have saved my life and saved my mother's life. As as dramatic as that sounds, I think that it it really may have done so. Um, hmm. So I haven't lived with my mother for a long time. I became an emancipated minor at 16, moved out on my own, dropped out of high school. It took me five years before I went back to college to get my four-year degree. And, and I hadn't lived. I, I moved away. I, I got away. Because at that point in my life, as a late teenager, I, I, knew, I knew that my mother was not a good person, right, at the very least. But I wasn't strong enough to hold on to that. And over time, I retconned the past and I rewrote history and I made excuses. And hmm. when I was in my late 30s, my, although I haven't lived with my mother, I had been bailing my mother out of, pu out of being homeless for years. I'd spent thousands of dollars on back rent, negotiating with her landlords, paying off utilities that she was too irresponsible to pay. I was constantly playing catch up so that my mother wasn't going to end up homeless on the street. And I finally got to a place and I said, I'm the oldest. It's going to fall to me to care for her. She's getting older. I better figure out a way that I can do this financially. So I bought a second house. I bought a house that was in foreclosure. Um, I put money into rehabbing it. It's just a ranch house. It's got two apartments in it, but it was a dump. Put a bunch of money into making it habitable. And I said, I'm going to give my mother a rent controlled apartment and I'm going to make my money on, on the market rate apartment. It was a very bad mistake bringing her back into my life. And within two years of doing this, I was hmm. ready I was ready to check myself into inpatient psychiatric ward. I was having a nervous breakdown. The abuse began okay. again. So I had to face it. So I faced it. It was a crisis. I had to go to court and evict my mother. It was the most consequential time of my life because it was the first time that I actually saw my mother for the person she really was and how very morally deranged she was. And I had to accept, and I did accept it, that my mother does not love her children because she is psychologically incapable of doing so, right? Okay. She doesn't love us in her own way. She's that broken. Once I was able to do that, and once I extracted myself from that, I looked around and almost instantly I said, Jesus Christ, you have replicated all the abuse from your childhood home in your choice of friends, in your political circles. Wokeness is full of this. These people are not who you thought they were. That's what woke me up. The, that sounds like a really huge crisis then because your primary relationship becomes, you know, it Im finally implodes. And then everything that you've built around that for, you know, whatever reason also implodes too. Where do you end up? Do you just end up, uh, you wake up in a Trump rally, um, <laughs> you know, walking around ready to insurrect the government? What, what happens? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so it's not, you know, uh, what my my experience is not actually it's not rare right there are a lot of people who've had that I, I, I you know it's it's a it's a an awakening of sorts right I don't mean to sound precious when I say that but but in a sense it really was an awakening um, not everybody has one that dramatically but many people do the first place you end up in is profound fear and depression that wasn't new to me I've been a depressive my entire life. <laughs> But this was this mm -hmm. this was new. Yeah, it was earth shaking. 
it really was earth shaking. I felt I could not feel the ground be steady under my feet. That was necessary. Okay. But it then it begins it begins a process of questioning why I believed what I believed. Did I have a reason? Did I have good reasons to believe these things? Why did I trust the people that I trusted? Did I have good reasons to do that or were they part of the way that I was fooling myself? Right? It's a long process. It's been almost six years now. I'm still going through it. I mean, the worst of it is, is over. It's okay. way over, right? But yeah, it is destabilizing. I lost almost all of my friends. Um, again, not unique. You know, I don't have... My story is not the worst thing that only a few people... You know, many, many people have been through this. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I lost, I lost what is my entire psychological world and had to start fresh. Yeah. So, starting fresh, what did you land on as the most trustworthy line of inquiry or uh, system of belief or axiomatic principle uh, to start over again? What was, the, what was the grain that you could remake a pearl out of? Understanding the difference, understanding that character is foundational, that, that okay. personal, moral character is the most important quality in a human being. Not okay. an R or a D after their name. Not whether they are a Catholic or a non-believer. Not whether they would call themselves left or right. Not their views on abortion. Not their views on food stamps. Not their views on immigrants. Character. Is this person of a normal moral character? They, you know, very few of us are saints, right? Do they have a normal range character and personality, or are they pathological? Are they distorted in the way that my family was, that my friendship circles were? That, that is, is probably the grain of sand around which to build the pearl, to use your, okay. to use your illustration. Yeah. So I don't belong to a political party now. Um, if, if I had to give an answer, I would say I'm closer to what people might think of as a classical liberal. Not, not a modern U.S. liberal. I'm not right-wing, I'm not left-wing. Although, I am substantively more conservative by a good degree than I was five or six years ago. So, unlike, unlike some of my friends who, who are not woke, who say, I didn't leave the left, the left left me. No, not for mm -hmm. me. The left did leave me, yes, it did change. But no, I did not stay the same. I am actually more conservative in, in my views. Okay. So, Here's a uh, might be left field, but I think it's related. Um, just to flip this thing over, there's a lot of narrative building in the mainstream and people with big audiences about Trumpism being fascist and the far right, let's just say the far right, the far right, the far right, the far right, which, you know, it, it becomes very bald. And just for an example, there, I think it was the Guardian uh, kind of, there was, okay, so in LA or somewhere around there, there was this man who walked into the woman's spa area naked and apparently he had a semi erection and then there was a big dust up outside she, of that she Benjamin uh, where she she it was a woman trans woman trans woman well this I'm is the thing so you. the you know and then they have the battle the woman stands up and the guys uh, a different guys like you're being transphobic and she's like it's not transphobic yeah. there's no such thing there's a penis around my daughter <laughs> whatever and then that turns into a narrative about transphobia at the spa and then the antifa and the proud boys or whatever show up and they start battering old women you know who want private spaces and then the you know the, the the media apparatus goes into overdrive and says this doesn't even ha this never even happened this is just the far right doing it and then it comes to light that this man was there and he is has yes. 60 or 40 
uh, convictions as a, you know, he's been exposing himself to women for years and years. And then yes. the Guardian, who had written this off as a hoax, has to go back and retract the story. And they do it in this really clever way. And they keep on talking about the far right, the far right, the far right, the far right. So yeah. that's one example of it, the narrative just refusing to give any leeway um, and cover its tracks by always having a bigger bad guy on the horizon than, you know, the erosion of women's uh, freedoms and uh, safety. But yes. with regards to calling Trump fascist or calling out like this right wing movement fascist, how is that or even saying that there's a cult of Trump? How is that not the same diagnosis that you applied to the woke? Well, it's OK. So what I think is going on here is because I used to, again, I I was that person. Right. Um I actually cried myself to sleep in 2016, the night Trump was elected, okay? I was one of those people. Yes, it's embarrassing. Absolutely. Sorry. But no! it, <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was re, right? Um, but I, so I understand it from the inside. I'm not, I'm very critical of this stuff, but I am not critical as an outsider. I'm critical as someone who yeah. lived it, okay? Yeah. So... I do understand it. I don't think it makes you a bad person. I think it makes you a very misguided person and, and potentially a very dangerous person. But it doesn't make you stupid. Um, it doesn't make you morally worthless. Um, it's, it's reversal. Benjamin, it's reversals. It's projection. One of the main features of cluster B mentality, and not just in people who, who actually are the diagnosable cluster B personality disorders, but the people around them, we sometimes we call them flying monkeys, like the Wicked Witch and the Wizard of Oz. You know, an army mm -hmm. of flying monkeys to do the witch's bidding. People act as flying monkeys for powerful narcissists and sociopaths. I was mm -hmm. a flying monkey for the liberal left. I was a flying monkey for my mother, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. You defend against that by reversing everything. You just put a conceptual mirror up in front of your face and say, everything you say to me, you're saying about yourself. So. The psychopaths do it. Psychopaths will accuse other people who are not who are normal of being psychopathic. Um, borderlines yeah. will accuse other people of being emotionally unstable. People who support fascistic dispositions in government will point to people objecting to that fascistic stance and saying they are the fascists. I think with Donald Trump, it, this won't be the same for everybody, but for those who are like me, Donald Trump, and I, I'm going to say this, and put some caveats afterwards. <laughs> I will, but but I'm just I'm just thinking that it won't matter because I'll say this, but the caveats will be clipped out, um, so no one will hear the caveats later. Doesn't matter. I can't defend against that. I am not certain about this. I go back and forth, and I'm sort of I'm thinking through how I think about this as I talk to you. So I may change okay. my mind. I do think Donald Trump is probably a clinical level narcissist. Um, the mistake that I think I made was I don't believe he is nearly as malignant as I thought he was and that all of the left thinks he is. I do not think he is actually a tyrant. I don't think he is um, I don't think he he is fi uh, primarily fascistic in his outlook. Um, I think I reacted emotionally to his manner, to his vulgarity, um, and some other boring things that won't mean anything to your audience, but that mean something to me. I think he pushed buttons that I had. And I overreacted to that. And because everyone else around me was overreacting, I thought my overreaction was normal. Okay. But it wasn't okay. normal. It's not normal for a 40-year-old man to cry himself to sleep because the opposing party got elected, right? There's something wrong with that. If he actually were the great Satan, if he were as bad as I thought he was, I'd give myself a pass on the crying, right? But he, he, but huh. he wasn't. He didn't turn out to be that way. So I think okay. that, I think it's projection. That's the, I, I think it is. I think it's not, it's not me, it's you. Well, then how do we guard? Okay, so there's, I guess, two large questions then. How do we 
help people who are caught up in a way of being politically where they are exhibiting traits that are antisocial and corrosive to the body politic, such as what right. you're saying cluster B on a grand scale could be doing. How do we, uh, how do we contact? How do we reach out? How do we project a way out of that to people? And right. how do we be on guard for that? Let's say on the right, if the GOP starts sure. getting a bunch of gatherings, because people are saying we're tired of critical race theory, we're tired of our children being medicalized and all that hidden from us. We're yes. going to go to this other side. How do we protect the pendulum, if there is mm -hmm. one, uh, from being infected with the same kind of psychopathy. Sure. Well, I will say, um, I'll, I'll tell you what I think we can do, but I will also tell you that it's not going to work. Okay? Here, here's the spoiler. What I'm going to say is going to disappoint the shit out of everybody listening here. There is a pendulum, <laughs> and I don't think we're going to stop it. Okay? So, but let's, let's pretend that we could stop it. What would we do to do that? <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I do my show. That's why I do Disaffected. Because the working thesis of this show is that we are living in a time that is structured along cluster B character disorder rules, cult rules. That we've been through these times before, but this one is acute and dire. And we need to understand it. I think the very first thing people need to do, which is why I never shut up up about this. We need to understand what cluster B is. This cannot be an academic discussion that people, oh, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist. Stop it. Stop it. You don't need to be a degreed professional to see character problems in people. These people have existed since the dawn of humanity. The agents wrote about them. Okay? Hmm. We need to understand that there is, a, there is a predictable rate of the population. Thankfully, it is a numerical minority, but it is not an insignificant minority. It is not a powerless minority. I don't care what the literature says, because the literature contradicts itself, but my guess is today, we're looking at between 5 and 10% of the population who fall into the cluster B pathology, okay? Much higher than mm -hmm. it used to be. <laughs> That's enough. That is enough to do what has happened here. Why is it enough? Because the rest of us cooperate with this. The biggest mistake that normal range non-personality disorder people do is that they fail to believe in human evil. These are people who will say, everyone is fundamentally good. You just have to dig deep enough to find it. That's okay. worse than Pollyanna. It's frankly stupid. It's stupid. And it is going to get us killed. Not everyone is good. That is not true. It has not ever been true. There wasn't a time when it was true that you can go back to. Luckily, most people are decent. But you have to accept the reality that there are some people who live in evil and, and do evil things. And that they are not going to change. What I talked about when we started this conversation, stop thinking of this as the kind of mental illness that you're sympathetic to in your friend. It's not. Cluster B disorders are not curable. The one exception, and it's a very, this is a very fraught one too. Borderline personality disorder can sometimes be successfully treated. There is some evidence of that, but the vast okay. majority of them are never going to get treated. And the reason why the cluster Bs uh, don't ever think you're going to change a, a pathological narcissist, you will never give a psychopath a conscience. Never. It has never happened. Why? Because the unique part of these disorders is that the people don't think there's anything wrong with them. A depressive or somebody with panic disorder knows that something is wrong with her. She knows that she's suffering and she knows the suffering's coming from her own mind. Not so with the cluster Bs. They didn't do something. You did something to them. It's, it's, it's what psychology calls egocentonic. Right? It means hmm. it is mm -hmm. consonant with your sense of yourself. They don't think they're wrong. Everyone else is wrong. So we need to see that. And we need to, dis we need to learn discernment. We need to learn how to detect character pathology in other people. And one of the ways to do that, you have to be observant. Keep your eyes open. Talk to other people and compare notes. Measure the actions of somebody that you admire against their statements. 
does their self-publicity match their actions in the real world? Sometimes that's hard to do, but if you take that as a goal, that's one of the ways that you're hard that's one of the ways that you can find out the truth. And a lot of times that means you have to observe people over time. This is about pattern detection. Mm -hmm. and so being aware that these things exist, evil, let's just say, as a collective term, like woke sure. and evil, you can just like, okay, we, we don't have to define it. We kind of know what that is. Um, recognize that and I get you said, so it's a lot of observation, but is there also not something to do on a systems level to make sure that those people aren't rewarded or those people <laughs> are yeah. somehow subjugated to the system so that their collective good outdoes their collective bad. I mean, short of just, you know, recognizing somebody and shuffling them off of society, um, is there ways to, you know, for a system to restrain and harness right. that energy, that personality? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to say that I don't want to stop short of that, Okay. I don't want to stop short of isolating them. I think that's a large part of what we need to do. Yes, that is what I mean. Okay. When you're talking about if you get good advice, psychological relationship advice, if you're dealing with a cluster B, the good advice is get them out of your life. Go no contact. Go no contact, right? And that's because these people aren't going to change, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we don't say. I mean, but when they take over a political, I know. What do we do you know, then? Like the social democrats, what would you? Um, well, I, and and I. It depends on the institution you're talking about. It depends on how far it's gone. But by the time a cluster B person or a collection of them or a cluster B system has taken over an institution. Let it burn. Let it burn. Walk away and build a new one. There is no such thing as taking it back. Take the ACLU, for example, okay? In my view, the ACLU is a Simon Pure example of what I call cluster B capture. And that's analogous to, if anybody's heard of regulatory capture, the phenomenon where industries take over government regulatory offices and they end up regulating themselves, the same thing, this is cluster B capture. It happens in churches, it happens in political institutions, it happens in campaign groups. It has thoroughly taken over the ACLU. The people at the top of the ACLU, in my opinion, are s profoundly morally character disordered. These are not salvageable people. These are dangerous people. They mean harm. That's how they eat. They eat other people's souls. I mean, I know that sounds melodramatic, but the fact that you've got mm. A young woman, a youngish woman who believes that she's a man and believes that she's a man so very hard that she's on testosterone and has been allowed to become the public face, the mouthpiece, and the agenda setter for this vaunted, long-term, storied institution tells you everything you need to know. Your ACLU is never coming back. Let it burn. Don't even bother calling the fire department. Walk away, and turn the hose on your house. So well, that your house doesn't burn. Yeah. So, is there something about the cluster B capture of an institution that leads to its inevitable self destruction? Can can these systems that are exhibiting and run by what we call cluster B can they operate and function over time or do are they, they can. not able they can but, just but they will have different consequences for the people that they affect than than a healthy organization let me let me back up a little bit and say how, okay so how do you stop this before it gets terminal right I think you can yeah. one be aware like I talked about a few minutes ago understand what you're seeing look for it if you, if you see it happening, you have to set up boundaries. You have to actually hold people accountable for their behavior, and you have to hold them accountable at every step of the process. This stuff starts somewhere. It's not like a psychopath comes along and all of a sudden it's psychopath city overnight the minute he takes the job, right? It starts stepwise. Mm -hmm. It's a very gradual ramp. Watch that ramp as it's happening and put fire breaks in there. That Don't wait until it's a crisis. If you've got employees 
who all of them, I'm, I'm just making this up as we go along, you can make up an example in your own head. Yeah. Imagine that you've got a team leader in an organization and you start to notice that the people on his team all tend to be absent more frequently on team meeting days or they tend not to show up for these things or they, they seem like they don't really want to tell the truth about something, you're probably detecting that this team leader has a poisonous character. Talk to those people, say, what's going on here? I see that you guys aren't producing your projects. I notice there's a lot of absenteeism. You don't, you know, and you have to be careful, right? You don't want to prejudge too quickly and point the finger. But when you see these things happening, you have to set limits and you have to hold them. Right. So if you get to a point where you see this team leader, if he's not working out, make him not a team leader. Remove him from the ladder of promotion if he is the sort of person who cannot maintain and retain employees. That's just one toy example I came up with. Have boundaries and stick mm -hmm. to them. And if you do that from the beginning and you do it as you go along at, at the shallow end of that ramp rather than the steep one, you may not get to the crisis. Mm -hmm. But this is a problem, Benjamin, so, for the left, particularly because, yeah, um, because people on the left want to think of themselves as nice people. Capital N, nice people. Capital C, compassionate people. Right? It often starts from a good place, but it is easily co-opted. And if you are not able to call a spade a spade, and if you believe that confronting a toxic situation mm -hmm. or an unfair situation, that the very act of confronting it is a social sin almost as bad as the sin you're trying to solve, then you are a pushover. You are being co-opted to allow someone else to do evil. We have to remember that being compassionate and trustworthy does not mean being capital N nice and being a patsy. So there is a, and I think maybe Peterson was warning about this. Um, well, he was more about the compelled speech, but there is a way in which politeness gives way to evil. Uh, we, I guess you can just think of Canada at large. Like they are implementing, they are just going full bore uh, with the with the way that they're going to be treating with their children with the gender issue and then other aspects of their government with the uh, lockdowns and, and stuff like that. Um, th they're very polite. This thing, this wokeness thing or this pathological um, desire to change the world for the better um, by making the whole world, in my opinion, worse, um, it can use nice people to forward itself. It can really take advantage of nice niceness and politeness and propriety. And without a, without a opposite of niceness, without meanness in some level, without um, firmness, eventually any system will yield to, uh, I guess, cheats and yeah. uh, people who will, you know, treat everybody else like suckers. So we need some sort of uh, guiding principle that kind of lays down the law or, as you say, calls a spade a spade. Um, and it's almost like we, are being in, we have been inculcated to be nice as a culture to the detriment of uh, not being able to draw borders around those who are borderline. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think also in a way, <laughs> in a way, there, there is an aspect of sexed behavior in this dynamic that I see some people talking about. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to talk about this because you get in cultural trouble for saying it because of the moment that we live in. But mm -hmm. in a very real way, on the woke left, and, and this has seeped out, in my, in my view, to all of our behavior in society, even if we don't consider ourselves to be on the woke left. In a way, this is a highly feminized cultural system, okay? Um, indirect statements, passive aggression, 
emotionality first, rationality second, or not at all if rationality doesn't play nice with my feelings. And I do not mean this in a, in a reductive, troglodyte, sexist sort of way that says women are incapable of thinking, women only feel. I am not saying that. Even though I just tried to disclaim mm -hmm. that, that is exactly what I will be accused of regardless. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I think we are living in a time where our discourse is excessively feminized and that the feelings first approach is culturally favored and it is assigned a higher moral weight and it is seen as a sign of being a good and caring person to such, to such an excessive degree that what 30 years ago would have seemed only a normal and moderate pushback from the side that said, take the feelings out, let's look at the facts, let's look at this from a cost-benefit economic perspective. That is seen as provocative. Mm -hmm. Sometimes more than provocative, it's actually called abusive, right? It's abusive mm -hmm. that you're asking me to think about this rather than to feel about this. And what pays us social wages now, right? We, we, we earn social livings as much as we earn actual money livings. What pays social wages mm -hmm. in this atmosphere is being seen to be empathetic, or what is called empathetic. The performance of faux empathy uh, and faux compassion pays us social dividends. This behavior is hmm. rewarded. And I believe this is why um, women are far more likely it numerically to be the the standard bearers for wokeness this is why you see and they they hate hearing this but they need they need to get over hating hearing this the people who are going to object to it because it's true and i think they know it's true for every one deranged transgender activist who is a male who's who's plumping for surgery for children or um, men can go, excuse me, trans women can go into any women's space, including a rape shelter. For every one man who's doing that or benefiting from it, my back the envelope calculation is that there are eight or nine women who are tearfully applauding this and holding banners up and being the advance guard for it. Trans, and I hear this a lot from the radical feminists, this is why they won't speak to me anymore, this is why I lost almost all of my friends who call themselves feminists. They call this a men's mm -hmm. rights project. Bullshit. This is a women's social project, and it has been from the start. What you've got are highly deranged men, highly narcissistic and unstable men, who are, in fact, cheaters, if you want to think about it in terms of game theory. Cluster Bs are the cheats. Yeah. Um, they are benefiting from this, but they are not the prime movers here. They are, in some ways, Svengali's or Rasputin's in some way, you see clusters of women, like groupies around them, tearfully saying, my beautiful trans woman friend Natalie is just the womanest woman, 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 woman ever, you know, and they're getting something out of hmm. this, and what they're getting out of it, I think, is they're getting these warm feelings that they're being the empathetic, nurturing woman that they're supposed to be, and they don't understand that they're being exploited. Not all women, of course. Obviously, that isn't true. But there is a huge sex imbalance in this right now. To the degree that wokeness and woke projects use stereotypically feminine orientation toward feelings, I think that we are living in that regime right now. Well, I've been able to point out in the least that with regards to language that is stripping woman down into parts like a womb haver, vulva owner, etc. Right. That has, if you look at where that's taking over, it's women's spaces. And by yes. which I mean the birthing, the birthing community, um, they're the ones who are deconstructing women. Yes. Um, and they're the ones who are even just not really thinking of men as penis havers, but they are, you know, yep. taking the vulva and kind of saying, well, it's just this add on to a human being. Uh, and when I have engaged in conversation about that from people who are affected by that, who are chased out of that community, who are dogpiled by that community, the gut reaction is that it's misogyny and it's just some sort of internalized patriarchy but i don't think that that's 
correct. I don't it might think be it's misogyny, correct either. But who hates women more than women? Just like who hates men more than men? I, yeah. I think that we we have a we have a pretty negative. Um, we have a tendency to create nemesis of our own sex yes. um, more so than the other. But um, it's difficult to correct something that gets into a space of that that like gender ideology once gender ideology becomes acceptable it's difficult to root out because it does it's in essentially all feelings like they even say when they try to describe what gender is it all it is is a feeling of self determination and then like the body is somehow over there it's it's this weird it's kind just of a discursive object breaking away from the body yeah yeah so it's really difficult outside of, you know, just standing up against it and repeatedly, I guess, letting the institutions that accept it burn. It's really difficult to combat it because it doesn't it doesn't stand up like you can just constantly say, look, this doesn't work. Yes, this doesn't work. And this is how people are getting caught up into it and then making horrible, irreversible mistakes about their body or their children's body. Yeah, that's all you can do is just. Yeah, and Point and I would, I mean, I would, you know, to the extent that that, uh, see, this worries me so much. Um, hmm. I this, I care about this, right? I really genuinely care about this. I'm very worried for all of us. I'm worried for our society. I'm worried for the mental and physical health of individual people, particularly children. This, this keeps me up at night, right? This is not abstract for me. I, I'm not saying it's abstract for most people, but I, I would. You feel this very deeply. I do, I do, and and you know some of it is is me. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, I am maybe by dint of of my chromosomal makeup, but also my early childhood experiences. I'm 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 a pretty highly emotional person myself, right? That I'm not opaque to myself, right? I I can be emotionally reactive more than the average dude, right? That's something that's true about me. But so that can be a handicap, but it but I I think that I'm seeing something real. I'm not the only person who sees it. But I think what I'm seeing is real. I think I have identified it for what it is in in large measure doesn't mean I'm right about everything and it worries me because that you know and and I would say to to the the transgender activists to the people who are are pushing for this who believe that they're doing the right thing and many of them do believe they're doing the right thing they think they're doing something helpful for children helpful for women helpful for for anyone who says I have a different gender identity even if you even if you find my point of view unpalatable and even if you need to grind your teeth while you're listening and, and stick pins in a voodoo doll of me. Do that if you need to. But if you could please just consider this. Because, believe it or not, I don't hate you the way you hate me. I really don't. <laughs> I'm not your enemy. Um, this is hurting people and they are cooperating in their own hurt and exploitation. And one of the ways that this is particularly true for women who are supportive of the transgender ideology or women, I believe that their diagnosis of why these men act this way is, is fundamentally wrong. They say this is misogyny. This is male typical hatred of women. I used to believe this too. Five years ago, I said this in the same words with the same stock phrases, okay? I get it that you can genuinely believe that. I don't think it's true anymore. And the big mistake that I made and that I believe that they are all making this behavior, this narcissistic acting out, this co-optation by males who are transgender who want to get their claws into our children and want to put them on a pathway to sterilization and surgery. This is this is this is just freaking psychopathic, okay? This is not male typical behavior. This is not based on a hatred of women. You know what this is? This is cluster B typical behavior. Hmm. This is psychopath typical behavior. This is narcissist typical behavior. And it is unstable borderline typical behavior. Whether it's a man or a woman doing it, that is crucial. Because, you know, to say that this is male typical violence 
It's true, statistically, that men are more physically violent than women, so far as I know. It is true that in abusive relationships, it is more likely that the woman will get killed by her husband than that the husband will get killed by his wife. Men are more dangerous. They are stronger than women. But if this were truly male typical, we'd be seeing this across the board with men or in a majority of men, and we're not. This is a minority of people. And the common denominator, because I am a pattern seeker, I'm a reductionist. I'm an unashamed, unapologetic reductionist. I think we've nuanced the shit out of everything until we can't think anymore. I think we need to start reducing mm. again. The common denominator mm. is character pathology, and it knows no sexual home. You see it in men and you see it in women. It will get expressed differently in people who are physically stronger and people who are physically weaker, but it's the same character pathology. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, how did societies that didn't have this organizational framework or this uh, diagnostic toolkit, how did they deal with this? Or did they all just eventually burn? Does this, is this just the end of civilization when, this, I know. when civilization is finally in the, the decadent phase? It's like, okay, well, we're going to let the crazies run the show. Right. The inmates now get to run the asylum because well, everybody else is divested. For some I think it depends on which societies you're looking at, right? And I, I can't make a grand claim about what societies per se used to do, but I can think of some examples mm -hmm. of different ways to do this that I, that I think we have evidence for. I mean, think about Think about when we lived in smaller villages or, you know, barely above the level of living in bands, families, bands, then tribes, then, you know, maybe villages, etc. When we lived on a much smaller scale, mm -hmm. not everybody came back from the hunting trip, did they? Some people accidentally fell in the river. Some people accidentally walked in front of the bow and arrow, didn't they? And sometimes those people were the village rapist or the village kitty fiddler, right? That is a way of mm -hmm. dealing with things. I'm not saying it's the way we should deal with it, but I don't think it's true that we didn't know how to deal with these things in different contexts. Um, okay. So some sort of calling, some sort of no contact. Yeah, shunning. And when Expulsion. that was on that level, that was how that was done. We could probably be a little bit more civilized about that. Yeah, we could be a lot more point. civilized. Maybe. You know, but, and, and not everybody, it's, you know, not everybody needs that same level. I mean, if you talked earlier, I liked the word you used, you talked about guardrails. That's a good, that's a good image to use. If we had more guardrails in society, then some of the, pe even the people who might fall into the cluster B diagnosable category, they would not have as many opportunities to act out as floridly as they do. They wouldn't be as dangerous to mm -hmm. us because we would, not only would we not be incentivizing their behavior, and we are, we're actually, we are applauding it. We are seeing cluster B behavior and we are clapping and saying, that's beautiful, that's authentic, right? It's sick. Remove that, but also mm -hmm. don't let them hurt people so easily. Don't trust your children with them. Don't hire them as teachers. Don't allow them to get a degree as a as a as a psychiatrist i mean the number of <laughs> i won't even go down that road i'm already in trouble with enough populations today i'm sure <laughs> that's a big one i like i like peeking at that abyss well I, you know i don't know what <laughs> are you saying psychologists yes yes i are gaming I am, psychology <laughs> here's here's what i'm saying the very thing that some people are hoping i'm not going to say is the thing i'm going to say there is a higher mm than background population percentage of character and personality disordered mental health professionals. That's just the truth. Anybody whose eyes are open can see it. it it's not most of them, right? It's, I'm not even saying it's mm -hmm. a numerical majority. I don't know what it is because I can't measure it, but I can collate life experience and I can look at around me and I can see what other people have been through. My own therapist says the same thing. Uh, he's very unusual. He's unwoke, this guy. This guy's old school. And he's very concerned about the state mm -hmm. of the profession. Um, yeah. Hmm. So I, I think it's along the lines. You see these listicles, right? You see, what are the top 10 jobs for sociopaths, right? It's, it's, like, it's like Glassdoor, but, you know, in a perverse sort of mirror world. Um, you know, are you a psychopath? Let's see what career path is right for you. We have surgeon, <laughs> doctor, media personality, and more, 
right? <laughs> it's just. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think it's I think it's true in that way, right? I mean, it's 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 true that among surgeons, you have a higher percentage of psychopaths among surgeons than you do again, our you know random background population, and there may even be. It might even give them yes. an edge. But um, bum, ching. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yes, that's th th and there may even be an adaptive or what's the word I'm looking for. Th uh, it may yeah. actually redound yeah. to our benefit in an indirect way in some of those cases because if you've got somebody who is so emotionally removed from from the the emotional consequences that most people would have to pulling an internal organ outside the body, that may be just the guy you need to give you that life-saving surgery, right? There may be productive ways mm -hmm. to channel this that are pro-social. These people always come with danger, yeah. though. They always come with danger, mm. right? So we have to think about okay. that. Yeah. But but I think there might be ways that they could be less dangerous and, 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 and more hopeful, helpful. Yeah. So what do we do now? I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know because... Oh. I, we're in the middle of it, and I have to remind myself, one of my failings mm -hmm. is I do tend to catastrophize, right? I assume that the worst outcome in a fraught situation is going to be the most likely outcome. So I worry myself excessively. On the other hand, I am much more discerning and much more accurate, I believe, in how I see the world than I was five years ago, 10 years ago, certainly more than 20 years ago. And I have enough experience now, you know, as I get close to 50, I have enough years on me that I can actually go back and say, okay, what were you right about and what were you wrong about? And what are you, what are you good at detecting? And honestly, I mean, I mean, it's just me, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I think that we are, we're not in a unique period of history because this is part of what happens in things like World War II. This is the psychology that took place in Western Europe. It's Third Reich psychology, right? Um, there, other times throughout history, it's been this way. The Tudor court was like this in um, early Renaissance England. I mean, talk about a nest of cluster bees. You, know, you can find this almost anywhere. But I don't know that we have been in it as thick as we're in it today. I don't know if I'm right about this, but mm. my gut tells me this may be one of the most florid times we've ever been in for this. And if I'm right about that, I don't know what we do. But, but maybe I'm not right. Well, it's, it, it's interesting. You can say I'm going to have no contact with those kind of personalities on the, on the interwebs, right? But those people are still gaining followers and, and churning out content that gives them a bigger platform by following a script. Yep. Uh, poor me, I'm going to save the world from fascism by forcing everybody to download an app and report to the government where they are every 15 minutes, you know, like stuff yep. like that. You know, I'm kind of going a little bit overboard, but um, you, you can't look away from it because it is everywhere. But there are promising signs. There was uh, some, some people are really upset that more and more uh, conservatives are getting involved in local government. Mm -hmm. Which is a good sign, yeah. uh, in in a way. I mean, uh, I could see that there could be a case to say that if we go too far right, then we are giving up some things. So, the peop the right ish or the conservative liberal needs to show up in the GOP meeting and add their voice to the mix. Um, but it seems like the left and the woke left, etc., has overstepped um, by finagling everybody's hobbies, going out and being hall monitors on a number of different levels, and then going and then ratcheting it up over and over and over again, burning cities down, taking over schools, teaching some totally nonsensical anti scientific scientific things and people are going to have a, a reaction to that. So there is there is promising, you know, signs that people are showing up. Yeah. Right. The people are no longer just sitting yep. this one out um, and allowing the personalities uh, to kind of take over things. So getting involved is the answer. Um, and maybe displacing, not just with regards to like uh, institution like the ACLU. Yeah, let it burn, but you, you can't, can't let, let City yeah, Hall right, burn. Right. You, can't you can't do go that. No contact with all of them. Yeah. There's certain places where you have to say, you know, and you can't let law. You can't let United States law serve this psychopathy. That's right. You can't do it. So there are 
battle lines that need to be drawn. Um, why disaffected then? Is that like a play on affective disorder of some sort? Um, your your podcast. It's, no, I know it's more of a play on how I how how I felt politically and and in terms of my relationship in society. I'm a mm-hmm. in in some senses I'm a disaffected liberal, right? The shine wore off. My okay. natural home that I lived in emotionally, politically, intellectually turned out to be a very different place than I thought it was. I had a fantasy of what it was, but its real character was something different. So I I think there are a lot of us who feel in some way disaffected, alienated from something that we thought we knew, something that we had been a part of, but that we didn't understand the nature of. That I think that's where it came from. Um, it's not a place that you want to stay mm-hmm. in, of course. You don't want to be primarily disaffected. You want to, okay, I'm going to have to spend some time thinking about that, but then I have to go to the next step. Um, okay. But, you know, when you talk about... Does that translate into the... Tri- I'm sorry. Well, I continue. mean, I think about your experience at Evergreen, right? That you documented so so thoroughly. And, I mean, I don't know how... Yeah, like, for example, as we're talking, we've been talking to each other for about an hour, um, and I think, I, but I'm not actually certain, because you're, um, you have a different way about you. You, you, um, you are a more circumspect person than I am. I'm kind of over the top and blunt. You're not. Um, so I don't actually know, as I sit here talking to you, I don't know if you think that my analysis, to the degree that you think it, it is correct or incorrect or what it's missing or what, I don't have a real good sense of that, but I would say, when I think about your experience at Evergreen, I see what happened at Evergreen, that, that you documented what happened to Brett and Heather and to other people there, and that, I'm sorry that I won't remember the, the names of all the primaries here, but that particularly to me, particularly mm-hmm. horrifying moment of an administrator, it might have been the president, who was being struggle sessioned, and he was asking permission to go to the bathroom, and it was denied, and he obeyed the order not to go to the bathroom. Am I, am I recapping that correctly? <laughs> He he actually there yeah there's this like little piece of footage too where he, they finally let him and then they kind of they have guards walking with him to the freaking bathroom right to <laughs> and then he, he and then when the legislature asks him about that he's like oh it was fine I I didn't like it but I, it was fine I I, wasn't, I, I didn't I, feel I, unsafe. You know, as they're taking over the entire building and haranguing everybody yeah. under him and making everybody but else But I look unsafe. at that. To me, Fucker. that experience at Evergreen, that is, that is a classic illustration of my thesis. I see cluster B pathology written all over that. That's psychopathy. That's narcissism. And, and, and we're not going to have time for this, but an interesting side thread that, that a person can explore is the relationship. How do the cluster Bs relate to each other in these dynamic interaction. So generally, not yeah. entirely, but generally, psychopaths and narcissists, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference and sometimes there isn't much of a difference, right? They tend mm-hmm. to rise mm-hmm. in a system that allows for that toxicity. They tend to become the CEO, the president, the, uh, the one with the megaphone, but they have henchmen and henchwomen. And the henchmen and henchwomen that are most useful to them are also fellow cluster bees. So the psychopaths and the narcissists, hmm. the borderlines are vulnerable to the narcissists and the psychopaths. The borderlines are the ones with the really unstable affect, the emotional instability. I hate you, don't yeah. leave me, yeah. you know? You want, what is borderline personality disorder? Have you ever had a friend or a girlfriend or a boyfriend who said, who you could describe as, I hate you, don't leave me on any given day? Then you know what borderline personality disorder is. These people will slave and slave and crawl through broken glass for a seductive or charismatic psychopath or narcissist. So a lot of times you see that happening, and I hmm. definitely saw that in the evergreen footage. Um, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to look at any individual person and say, I know this is their diagnosis, but I could clearly see that yeah, going yeah. on. But look, Evergreen yeah. didn't come back, did it? No. Wasted away on the vine. Um, you know, they, they eventually, you know, there's rumors that they admitted that they went too far, but they never admitted that the ideology that they 
upheld and put in place was uh, at all the cause of their undoing. They can't do it for whatever reason. Well, because the entire structure of Washington now is completely woke. So they, they can't afford yeah. to critique it because all of their money comes from the Democrats. That's the only reason they, they survive at this point uh, is through the legislature. So they have to. I was wondering where, where that came from because their, their admission numbers went off a cliff, didn't they? Yeah, they're down. I think they'll be down to 2,000 and they should be at 4,000. So they, they began, George Bridges, he just left, but he, he kind of gutted the college by 50%. I mean, COVID came and didn't help at all either. But and so right. getting back to my circumspect um, reaction to this, I think it's fascinating. I think these are great tools. I have seen diagnoses not actually be good for public discourse and especially okay. let's say within small groups once people start diagnosing each other uh, it's not a really yep. good way of fixing solving problems or g making a group more cooperative so it, it is good from a disaffected or from a removed level of analysis to say that mm -hmm. here are some patterns of behavior that happen that occur over and over again here's this institution here's that institution but i don't know if that can scale into action it's still a diagnosis. It's okay. not something that I think is good for people who want to get involved. I think that setting that aside, I mean, holding it as a framework is good, but that can't be the mode of interaction with society of looking. Maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. I just, I can see that it could be clumsy or not well yes. implemented if you're trying to yes. do it something good in the world and build a system that's better than what we have. Right. Yeah, no, and well, well taken. And, and there, of course, there's a lot of evidence for that, right? Like, we see this happening. We see people diagnosing each other all over the place and causing even more social yeah. unrest. Well, one of, one of unrest. the problems with Evergreen was that it stopped being a college and became a group therapy session. That's exactly what it right. did. And I saw that implemented over and over. I'm not proposing that. I'm not proposing that. I think one of the problems with a current wokeness is that it, it, it treats society like a group therapy session. I completely agree with you. I don't think we should be in a therapeutic mode with people. But I would say mm. this, to, to and your, your reasonable objection, your reasonable pushback is shared by a lot of people. And I would say this to people who share that point of view. Okay, so if we're to say... All right, this is an interesting way to look at it from a distance, but we can't apply this, say, in real life groups. Well, I would ask you to answer me this then. What happens if you're in that group? Let's say you're in a group of 15 people in a political action committee or something, and you notice somebody there that you're pretty goddamn sure is a, yeah. is a psychopath, a narcissistic psychopath, right? Yeah. Like, you've thought about this, you've made the connections, you can see how they interact with people, and you say, eh, I can't really say this, but I think that's going on. Is it really the case that it is more destructive to say, folks, what we're dealing with here is not just normal disagreement, what we're dealing with here is somebody who's manipulative by nature? Okay. Is that really the worst thing? Or is well, it worse to let that psychopath stay there? Okay. Yeah, as long as, yeah, that is the proper way, the improper way of say, let's try to fix this person, or um, no, you can't. if you don't do it too soon, then they'll lean into everybody's politeness, and then they'll have more roots than you will, if you object, and they'll right. probably sense you before you sense them, I'm sure, yeah. um, in a system that favors them. Um, so yeah, I, I do. Yeah, no, I, that that's just the question. I I probably phrase things less circumspect circumspectfully than I wanted to, but I could see that psychology or diagnostics it yeah. doesn't always translate into things. People can we can get stuck, yeah. and actually we can feel um, as ingesters and producers of content of this nature, we can kind of rest on our laurels of like I have it figured out because that doesn't actually. Yeah. it does help people to call out these teachers to find the antifa teacher and to find the TikTok liberal teacher and stuff like that. I just I'm wary that that is a way of us removing ourselves from actually doing anything because we have the moral high ground now. We can look down on people now right oh i i i yeah yeah that that certainly isn't something that i would want to see that's not that's not what i want to do and it's not what i want to mm -hmm. suggest to, that other people do um i'm very judgmental um but it believe it or not yeah it i 
it's not for the sake of being judgmental and getting a little charge that says I figured this out. Yeah. I, yeah. I already think I have figured out a great deal of the answer. I don't have all the answer, but I think I'm, I'm mm -hmm. confident enough that I have figured it out. I don't need to get an ego boost by having other people say to me, oh, you know, yeah, 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 look at those stupid people. That's not what I'm about. I don't care about that. Because people can disagree with me all the time, and I still think we are left with the same problem for the same reasons. But mm -hmm. I think, think of it this way. What I would like... What I would like to see people do, and if I can help them to learn how to do this, then, then I do get a lot of gratification out of that. I see this as analogous to helping a friend who has a series of abusive romantic relationships. Many of us have had a friend at some point in our lives who always hooks up with a bad guy or a bad woman, right? Over and over again, somebody who ends up couch surfing, then moves into the house and never pays rent, ends up being a drug addict, ends up being a thief, or domestically abusive, or, or a rapist, right? I, we, when we try to help these people, whether we're helping them as a, a crisis counselor itself, or, or just as a friend in a peer group, mm -hmm. we, we say, Susan, I want to help you detect these guys before you bring them into your home and into your heart because I've seen you get hurt and used by them before and I think I see a pattern. I think that these guys fit a character type and I think that you're vulnerable to them. Right? Mm. So what I'd like to do, if I can help you, I'd like to talk to you about this and help you see it too so that you can avoid it. So if you would want to help a friend make better choices and, and begin to see how the friend's own blindness or emotional grooves that they get worn into and they go around in circles. If you, if you can think about that, I want to help you make better. I don't want to see these people keep coming into your life. That is kind of what I would like to see on a societal level. Right. Okay. I'm not yeah. proposing. I'm not propo We can't fix these. Benjamin, we can't fix these people. I'm not even motivated to try. We cannot fix them. Their own shrinks can't fix them 99% of the time. That's the thing. This is, it's not, it's qualitatively different. It's okay. not your friend with bipolar who, if she has lithium salt, can live a normal life. It is not your friend who is working through post-traumatic stress disorder and is much calmer today than he was 15 years ago when he self-medicated with drink, you are not gonna see, we can't make that progress with this kind of disorder. So I'm not trying to do that. Part of what, I'm, okay. what I hope to do is to get people to stop expending effort on trying to fix those people and, and redirect that effort to recognizing when they are present and, and erecting appropriate guardrails and boundaries. That's my goal. Well stated. So what's coming up next for the Disaffected podcast? What do you got on the horizon? Um, well, just if pumping you ask, out content like a good little yeah, YouTuber? Yeah, well, little being the thing. I mean, this is all new to me. I, you've been doing this, what, four or five years now? Yeah, four or five years. Is that years about now. right? Or has it been about less four. than that? No, four. Four and yeah. months. So I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know how fast we're supposed to grow. I don't know um, in what direction mm -hmm. we're supposed to go. I mean, things will change. We'd like to grow the show, obviously. Um, and, um, you know, branch out into, you know, we're I, over time, we're going to be adding more audio only content too. like right now we're doing about an hour and a half hour and 45 minute video show. I mean, it's basically television, right? You know, I monologue for yeah. most of the time and I have an interview, da da da. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be doing we'll doing more audio stuff and we'll see where that goes but um, you know it's I'm really I'm really glad to get a chance to talk to you because I've been listening to you and I followed you on social media long before we knew who each other were um, and and the people that you end up talking to are, are you know there's a certain sense in which the, the sort of territory we're in is a little incestuous, right? We, we all end up talking to each other a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the subject matter is similar. But, but I think that, that those of us who do talk about this stuff, I, 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 we need to. I really think we need to. And we may not have all the answers. Um, 
But this is the important stuff right now. I, in mm. terms of the health of our society, the things that you talk about, the guests that you bring on your show, that you will talk about, that other people won't talk about, this is crucial stuff. Um, I'd like to think, I'd like to think there will come a time when society has changed enough that it, I won't feel as disaffected. I won't feel that I have to spend as much time talking about this, maybe for you or for uh, Constantine and Francis at trigonometry. Uh, you know, I can imagine them, you, you, we all might say that too. I wish I didn't have to talk about this stuff every day. I hope we get to the point where we can <laughs> put ourselves out of business on a subject matter, right? Yeah. But I don't see it happening right around the corner. <laughs> so. No, there's a lot of snow to shovel and a lot of conversations that we had and a lot of new voices, unheard voices to give platforms to and to lift up. So thank you for throwing your hat into the ring and thanks for giving thank me uh, the opportunity to pick your brain, unspool your past just a little bit. And learn thank from you. you for doing what you're doing and thank you for you know for letting me come on your show and 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 share this with people um it's um it's it's important work it's important work i appreciate you thanks absolutely that is the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.